Right, so here we are. Yeah, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Annika Berlin. Uh, I'm a program management officer at the UN Environment Program Sustainable Mobility Unit uh, based in Nairobi. And we are partner of the Solutions Plus program that um, all of you are, I think, familiar with now. And um, so I just wanted to um, remind you again that we had this uh, battery training in two parts. The part one was focused on electric twin three battery solutions. And now we're talking about the end of life management of EV batteries. Um, and just as a recap uh, from day one, um, so yesterday we had an introduction from uh, UMI, from Emily Martin and uh, Juan, that uh, explained to us the differences of uh, reuse, repurposing, recycling. Uh, they gave some examples of the benefits of a circular economy with regards to batteries and different strategies for, for recycling of batteries. And then that was a, a great overview that then led us to some case studies that we had from uh, starting with Rwanda, uh, SLS Energy from Rwanda, who, um, uh, first of all, highlighted the importance of treating battery waste um, uh, for, for, for different applications, and then uh, presented a very nice, interesting study on how they uh, were using batteries, uh, repurposed batteries for uh, telecom tower operators. And uh, then uh, we, we stayed in Rwanda and heard from Enviroserf about um, their um, uh, top-notch uh, e-waste dismantling and recycling facility in Rwanda and about different uh, initiatives and strategies they have implemented to collect uh, batteries in Rwanda and how they uh, integrate uh, uh, second-use batteries for off-grid products. And then we moved over uh, down south to South Africa where we heard from Ethan from OILO about South Africa's approach to uh, end-of-life management of batteries and the interesting work they've done under the CESA project, which is another uh, EU-funded project for sustainable energy solutions for Africa, where they're um, working on a pilot project to um, demonstrate second-life batteries for energy, energy storage applications. And then uh, last but not least, um, we heard from Batteries, um, a company based in uh, Germany, uh, that design uh, batteries for upside and repair. We saw the, that uh, the batteries after you know, the life in the EV, they're still 70 to 80% that can be used for um, other applications. So they explained their approach to um, uh, upcycle the batteries from after the EV use and the importance of having uh, battery management systems and using um, AI for battery analytics uh, where they will improve the safety and the, the application of these batteries. And then uh, we had a very, very interesting panel discussion uh, moderated by UN Habitat uh, that invited all the, the speakers uh, to discuss uh, technical and financial feasibility of end-of-life batteries. Um, yeah, that was joined by ULO, SLS Energy, and Virusurf and Batteries. And uh, with that, I will hand it over to my colleague, uh, Emily Martin. Uh, who's going to give us a bit of an uh, introduction or, or a summary of the panel discussion, which is part of uh, yeah, just to sort of the agenda again. So um, uh, this is now our second part after to be here again from Rwanda uh, on the policy side of batteries, because this is the focus of today. Yesterday we had our technical details on how to uh, recycle and reuse repurpose batteries. So today we want to dive in more into the policy side, which is also uh, a few of the questions that were in the chat yesterday, how to develop a roadmap for um, recycling or reuse of batteries. Um, so that's why it's, we're super excited to have um, Minister of Environment of Rwanda uh, and also the examples of extended producer responsibility in Kenya. Um, and then we have in between these sessions, we have time for question and answers. You can always also put your questions in the chat uh, and we will address them after uh, the presentations. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, at uh, 3.15, we have uh, breakout room sessions where we want to um, uh, build on what we've heard in the sessions before on Kenya and Rwanda and develop um, some ideas on um, how to move forward on a policy for um, uh, EV um, uh, battery management. And there we have the chance to either join the group in Rwanda and in Kenya. And then we meet back again in the big room where we give a feedback uh, and some conclusions. Yeah, and with that now, I'll give it over to Emily. Thank you. Thank you, Anika. I will now uh, give a bit, very brief overview of the discussion that we have in the panel session yesterday. 
Um, as Annika said, it was a particularly rich discussion. Uh, we had the chance to have uh, four uh, very interesting companies presenting their experience and uh, the challenges that they face as well as possible uh, ways forward. Um, so very rapidly, we discuss uh, challenges in terms of technical and financial aspects um, for both uh, second life batteries, uh, so both secondary applications uh, as energy storage systems, and for uh, recycling. Um, so for instance, to give you some, some, some examples of what we discussed in terms of technical challenges, um, SLS Energy mentioned the challenges linked to the lack of uniformity or the mismatch between uh, battery cells to build repurposed battery packs. Um, also, how to estimate the residual value in the EV battery after its automotive use, so the first life. Um, then EnviroServe Enviro Renda highlighted that uh, the proper storage of batteries uh, by the customers is really critical to reduce fire risks. Then uh, Willow stressed that having constant supply of EV batteries for second life use um, is not always uh, easy um, and also having enough information from the battery manufacturer um, is something absolutely key uh, to be able to build uh, second life battery packs. Um, batteries also highlighted the fact that uh, new EV battery technologies constantly evolve and therefore it's also challenging sometimes to um, make use of to, to design these second life applications. Um, and the certification of these second life battery packs um, is also uh, a, a challenge. There are also financial hurdles. So for instance, um, finding the right business model and pricing these batteries that are uh, still so used batteries, um, it's not something very always easy. Um, and convincing customers that these batteries do work, um, it's also something that uh, where, where efforts is, is needed. So here we had the quite uh, similar feedback from both SNS energy and, and batteries. Um, there are also high costs uh, linked to disposal and recycling. Uh, customers not necessarily willing to uh, provide financial support um, and we low uh, stressing costly recycling equipment. However, with the positive aspect that this equipment can also be used by uh, different types of waste. Then we went into um, the discussion regarding uh, the next steps, so the way forward. Um, and a, a key point was uh, to highlight the need for cooperation, and these on multiple levels. Um, so that can be a cooperation between um, second life or recycling entities and the battery manufacturers. Um, what we discussed before was that it's really important to exchange information about the performance uh, of the battery in their first life. Um, so this cooperation is really critical. Um, building also connections between producers and recyclers as well as the associations is important. Um, making sure to reap the benefit of uh, current academic research uh, is really key. Uh, for instance, that's done by SLS Energy together with uh, the MIT. Um, and providing collaborative approaches, also connecting local and international players, that's also a lever to, to facilitate this collaboration um, as it is done in the Solutions Plus project or the CESDA project. Um, policy is critical to build trust in the market, to send the right signal so that uh, finance uh, stakeholders can also support this transition. Um, and because indeed these investments are, are really needed. And last but not least, um, participant highlighted the need for capacity building and technical knowledge sharing for all in the value chain. Um, with um, the, the final, the overarching message that it's really important to develop local value chains in um, African countries because it doesn't make so much sense to uh, import costly batteries to then only use them for the automotive life and then sending them back. Um, and there is also a huge opportunity that is identified for certain life EV batteries in, in Africa cost-wise. So that was a very rapid overview of what was discussed yesterday, um, and we look forward to today to dive a bit deeper into the policy side. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Emily, for that great overview. And I think, yeah, it really showed uh, that uh, the challenges and, uh, are similar uh, across countries. And uh, I think it was just good to see that there was lots of agreement uh, between the panelists on, on this topic that Emily just uh, highlighted for us. Um, and then without further delay, I'm actually excited to give it uh, again to our colleagues from Rwanda. 
to um, Ms. Uh, Vanessa Omojoni from the Ministry of Environment of Rwanda to um, show us um, what uh, Rwanda has done in terms of e-based policies. And with that, over to you, Vanessa, and thanks again for, for being here with us. Uh, thank you, Annika and the team. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, speaking with you and I hope you can all hear me well. Yes, we can. And we can see the slides. Thanks a lot. Uh, great. Uh, so uh, my name is Vanessa Mutoni, and I work for the Ministry of Environment as a Green City Development Specialist. Um, a little bit about the presentation outline. I'll talk about the background, the introduction to the policy, the framework, the achievements, challenges, gaps, and uh, way forward. Uh, looking at the background, the government of Rwanda identified information and communication technologies uh, as enabling factors for socioeconomic development of the country. And the demand of electrical and electronic equipment has increased um, over the years in Rwanda as we're trying to develop and also to increase our technology in different areas, whether it comes from whether it's for uh, uh, for the economy of the country or if it's also for infrastructure or education purposes, and uh, the increase uh, there was an increase in ICT usage and high consumption of electric, uh, electronical and ele electrical. Uh, Uh, when we look at the progress, the the, e, the electronic waste policy was developed to provide a comprehensive guidance uh, for the efficient and effective management of discarded electrical and electronic equipment uh, through appropriated legal and uh, regulatory instruments, which promote green development and ensure sustainable growth of the country. And as uh, we look forward to achieving the vision 2058 that we have in vision 2035 that Rwanda has of becoming more, uh, uh, have low emission and be more sustainable, especially in green growth. I think this is, uh, having this policy is uh, very, very important to us. As for the policy and regulation, uh, there was an organic law that was uh, introduced in 2005, determining the modalities of protection and conservation and promotion of uh, environment in Rwanda in Article 33, and the law number 09, which was introduced in 2013, uh, established uh, uh, by Rwanda Utilities Regulatory Authority and determining the mission, powers, and organization and its functioning. And uh, lastly, the regulation that are based on uh, law number, um, number 24 from 2016, which was implemented in 2016 as well. Uh, for governing uh, information and communication technologies, um, which will be found in Article 130. I uh, will be able to share with that with all of you uh, after. Uh, looking at the objective of the regulations, the regulations apply to every producer, uh, retailer, importer, collector, uh, dismantler, uh, recycler, and consumers, or anyone in general in the manufacturing assembly cell. So, that portrays or use it or, or in the processing of electronic and electrical equipment of the electronic waste in Rwanda. Uh, they were also, it was also established for the protection of the environment, most importantly, and also the human health by preventing and reducing the adverse impacts of the regeneration and management of waste from electrical and electronic equipment, and also by promoting resource efficient through the reuse and recycling and other forms of recovery of e-waste management and environmental friendly manners. Uh, the Rwanda Bureau of Standard has established standards of, of addressing the e e electronic waste management. As part of the implementation, uh, Rwanda as a country as a whole, we have one uh, electronic waste handling facility in which is located in Ugesera. And uh, it, it is also used for other different types of uh, waste, not just electronic waste, but also solid waste. There are different types of license uh, in Rwanda that you are required to have for e uh, electronic waste management. Uh, one of them being um, the collection transportation service license. The second one being uh, the dismantling um, service license. And the third one being the recycling service uh, license. Uh, when it comes to um, the techniques, 
the technical requirements for collection and disposal for the, for the collection purpose of uh, of e-waste management uh, and adequate equipment of collection and transportation are required as specified in in the e-waste management standards um, we must prove that there will be segregation at, at source of the electronic waste with other types of solid waste and it will be handled separately in accordance with the standards and uh, <clears throat> please excuse me uh, a collection point uh, is needed at adequate to, to serve the geographic area and the volume of separated uh, electronic waste uh, tonnage that are captured um, because the electronic waste come from different uh, areas so it, it is needed to have to understand the geographic area and also to educate the people who are around that area and uh, lastly for the collection uh, you must acquired at the certificate of environmental impact assessment and for the disposal you must have an environmental impact assessment as well undertaken before establishing um, e-waste facility and have an environmental audit for existing facilities and lastly have the appropriate facility complying with the environmental standards of Rwanda and the vision of the vision of Rwanda as well. Uh, looking at the responsibilities of the collectors, uh, the refurbishers and the cyclists, uh, the collectors must ensure the uh, electronic waste collected are stored in proper ways and secure manner until, it sent, until it's sent to the licensed recycler. Uh, you, we must keep the records of the electronic waste handled to make records available for the scrutiny of the regulatory authority and ensure there are no damages that are caused to the environment and the human health during the storage and trans transportation of the e-waste management and also the people living in that area. Uh, uh, for the refurbishers, we must ensure the facility and dismantling um, processes are in accordance to the national published standards and uh, the non-recyclable components must be sent uh, to the author authorized treatment, storage, and disposal facilities uh, and ensure the resultant uh, e-waste is transferred to a licensed collector, as it's also mentioned in the previous uh, section. As for the recycler, uh, it is important that we ensure that the facility and the recycling process are in accordance with the standards published by national standard. So basically, as, as I keep repeating that we must be uh, in complying with the national public standards because we must, um, every single collector and producer and, and recycler must have, must go through the same process to make sure that there, there are no uh, social, economic and environmental effects in the, in the future and uh, ensure the, the residues generated thereof are disposed of um, in waste storage treatment facilities. When it comes to the uh, to the challenges and gaps um, for the policy, um, it is important to minimize the adverse effects of electronic waste uh, in general on the environment and the human and health through appropriate legal and regulatory uh, framework of the e-waste management. And uh, it can be sometimes difficult uh, due to uh, and or, or a lack of like a legis legislations on the waste management and uh, certain existing uh, frameworks. And sometimes poor inf infrastructure can be also part of it, especially looking at the topography and the landscape of Rwanda with being a very hilly area and the disposal of and immensely contrib contributed to the current inadequate uh, waste management. For the finance, um, I think, think it is important to adopt a comprehensive strate strategic plan that aims at uh, attracting private investors in the e-waste management, um, e -waste management uh, uh, sector, and also to adopt innovative financial models and instruments to finance the sustainable management. Uh, when it comes to awareness, um, as uh, I think many of us and many countries around the world uh, still face the challenge of um, making uh, the awareness of electronic waste management because uh, technology has been 
key to the development countries and developed countries and as a way to communicate to develop to construct for constructions for medical uh, in different ways for immobility for different uh, areas in aviation as well uh, therefore i think uh, the assessment of waste management and trends in rwanda can are very limited sometimes uh, and uh, um, due to the risk of inadequate handling and disposal and uh, within the public, private, and especially general, the Rwandan community as well. Um, when we look at the gaps, uh, I think it's, it's important to increase the national awareness, like I just mentioned, and the capacity of e waste management to the potential to stimulate investment and create green jobs in e-waste and reuse and recycling industry. Uh, it also include e-waste management in educational curriculums at various levels and especially in TV schools and support technology development innovation in the field of e-waste management and control, which has been happening the last couple of years in Rwanda, as we have seen the trend that has changed over the last five years um, and um, as the sector is still building itself I, I think it's important to know that every sector whether it's environment or infrastructure or finance department or and other institution like ggi every every single one of us play a big role when it comes to the sector building however it's important to have um a designed, a well-designed uh, framework. Uh, and I think in the challenges and gaps, I was able to also add in all together the, um, the way forward for Randa as well. So um, that's all I have. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Vanessa. Uh, this was very interesting. No, you highlighted especially the the importance of, of all different actors that are involved in e-management policy, you know, like the recyclers, refurbishers, uh, collectors, yes. and of course also you no know, different sectors that need to work together to kind of create this uh, ecosystem around uh, e-waste uh, management. But it's very important right. that you have this uh, institutional framework in place. Um, so I think mm -hmm. that's a great work that, that uh, you have done at the Ministry of Environment. Um, okay. But yeah. Uh, Thank as, you very much. Yeah. Thanks, thanks a lot, Vanessa. And I'm sure there will be some questions later also to how you got to this point. Uh, but then also, um, as our next speaker, I would like to invite um, Jihan Biko from ICLE Africa, who have um, done an assessment of uh, the gaps in terms of end of life management specifically regarding electric uh, vehicle batteries. Um, so I'm very excited to, to hear from you um, what, uh, what you found in your gap assessment. So over to you. Thanks so much, um, Annika. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, wherever you're joining from. <laughs> um, I'm very excited to be here. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen quickly. Um, uh, I'm Johan Biku. I um, am based in Cape Town. Um, and I work uh, for ICLE Africa. Um, I'm a senior professional officer um, at ICLE Africa. Um, and for those who are unfamiliar with the work of ICLE, um, so we are a local government organization um, of um, your local and subnational government organization who um, membership organization who are committed to sustainable development. And we, um, we have around 2,500 uh, um, um, government organizations as part of the network globally. Um, and I specifically work for the African Secretariat uh, where we support local governments um, in different areas of, of sustainable development from crime, climate change um, uh, to uh, different um, urban systems uh, uh, thematic areas such as sustainable mobility, circular development, food systems, um, as well as bringing in nature-based solutions um, and other uh, sort of sustainable development thematic areas. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about a proposal that we've been working on um, together with uh, the Development Bank of Rwanda, FNEWA, um, as well as Carbon Trust. And it's around accelerating the deployment of electric mobility in Rwanda and specifically looking at um, electric motorcycles. 
Um, so this uh, proposal was submitted uh, to the NAMA facility, um, and we're currently in a detailed preparation phase, just sort of a, a feasibility study to um, uh, further develop the proposal that we're working on. Um, and it's really, I mean, the NAMA facility is around um, developing a pr projects uh, that support nationally appropriate mitigation actions in countries. Um, and the two main elements uh, that these proposals need to have is, is unlocking climate finance um, for climate mitigation projects, um, as well as pro uh, funding projects that have a high mitigation potential um, and reducing carbon emissions um, quite significantly. Um, and so this really um, leverages off um, the, the ambitions of Rwanda. And so currently the transport sector accounts for around 13% of national emissions in Rwanda. Um, and quite a big bulk of it is, is from motorcycles. Um, currently they are around, in Rwanda, they are around 100,000 estimated uh, motorcycles in the country and in Kigali um, about 25,000 operating. Um, Again, estimated amounts, and I mean these are these are growing quite significantly, um, and make up around fifty percent of vehicles on the road. Um, so motorcycles account for around forty-two percent of petrol emissions, and they have many adverse um, impacts, including um, air pollution, re um, reducing air quality, and, and contributing to air pollution, um, as well as more of a reliance on imported liquid fuels. Um, and so, as I've mentioned, the government of Rwanda has quite um, very impressive, very ambitious targets around reducing carbon emissions from the transport sector and specifically motorcycles um, by 2030 um, and introducing electrification um, and really phasing out ICE motorcycles by 2025. Um, so just a quick um, overview of the proposal that we're working on. Um, so we are requesting funding to provide technical and financial support to accelerate the uptake. Um, the, the technical support hub will, will aim to um, accelerate or, or to, to support um, developing an enabling environment. Um, and one of the key um, elements uh, that we're including in the technical support hub is really around uh, developing roadmaps for battery and e-waste and automotive reuse and recycling as well. Um, so this review that we've done, it's a, it's a high level review, but we've um, just to get a bit of an understanding around um, the current situation in Rwanda. Um, and then the biggest component of this is financial. Um, and so it's really um, around uh, developing a credit enhancement facility, um, um, providing finance, because finance is the biggest barrier to, to uptake. Um, and then I think a, a big, uh, one of the key elements of the financial component is a rebate scheme. So the one element is to subsidize down payments for motorcycle operators, but the other part part is also to to have it uh, function as a bit of a um, take back scheme and, and monitoring of uh, ice motorcycles that are coming off the road and being um, yeah they are coming off the road and um, electric motorcycles that are going on. Um, and so really around uh, enabling a financial environment, uh, tran market transformation around this, um, decarbonizing the sector and improving women's participation as well. Um, so as I've mentioned, a review was done. Um, I'm going to touch on not just electric motorcycles, but also uh, ice motorcycles, because I think these two are very much connected. Um, and so thinking about quite a huge uptake. I mean, the, our program aims to um, deploy around 58,000 uh, electric motorcycles in the next five years. Um, and so with this large uh, deployment, there is potential environmental impacts of, of, of this uh, type of, of program. And so it's really important to consider the different waste volumes that come from this and the types of waste um, that, will, that will be generated. So the two things that we looked at was the waste created through the scrapping of ICE motorcycles um, as a result of the rebate scheme, but also as a result of transitioning to electric motorcycles, um, as well as those that are written off, and the, and as well as the, e, the waste that has been generated from e-motorcycle technologies um, once they've reached the end of life uh, span. Um, so we did a quick overview uh, or, or re review 
of policies that are in existence um, in terms of electronic and automotive waste in Rwanda. And there are quite a number of really good policies. And as Vanessa has taken us through, the big one is the national e-waste policy for Rwanda. Um, and another one that I'm aware of, but that is still in draft form is the extended producer responsibility um, that will also tackle e-waste, um, which, which is really great. Um, and then there are another diff a, a number of different um, yeah, policies that that, uh, uh, that talk about the management of waste and e-waste, legal frameworks around how to dispose of them, as well as regulations uh, related to it. Um, I think the, the biggest gap that we found possibly is that there is scope to have more clarity and potentially more detail on uh, the handling of different types of automotive waste, but also batteries and specific electronic equipment related to electric vehicles specifically. Um, so really just differentiating electronic waste a little bit more um, and then yeah, um, the possible different types of handling of these. Um, and then we did a, a quick a stakeholder overview. Um, and so this is just a this is just in draft form. And so I think it will be really fantastic from this group to to um, let us know if we're missing anyone um, and potentially in the breakout rooms to go through the different stakeholders that make up this ecosystem around automotive waste as well as electric waste. Um, so yeah, just differentiating between the policies, the public sector that govern the policies as well as the regulation and standards, um, as well as the implementation thereof from the public and the private sector. Um, uh, from the... Um, private sector so as i mean we've heard a little bit from environment embarrassed of yesterday there are also 12 licensed waste collection service providers um there's there's an informal market also that's existing um especially around automotive waste um there are different organizations that are starting to um uh, uh sort of work on second life of, of e-waste and then also the e-motor manufacturers play a role in um, battery uh, development, as well as recycling and, and retrofitting of ICE motorcycles. Um, so there are quite a number of different stakeholders. Um, so the current the findings that we have found, um, so as I've mentioned, we've been looking at all the ICE motorcycles, but as well as e-motorcycles. Um, so ICE motorcycles really, um, there's two things that happen to them. First one is that they get resold um, to rural areas and potentially to other um, countries. Um, and so there's this, this sort of flow of, 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 of ice motorcycles that are not used as, and then the others are sold for scrap metal and spare parts. Um, and what's left over res, uh, ends up in, in the landfill site. Um, around e-waste, um, there are e-waste e collection points. Um, however, there is a challenge around awareness, around a uh, way to dispose of, of electric waste. And I think, uh, and then some of them possibly end up in the landfill. Um, as, and then there is uh, some capacity for dismantling and recycling in, in Rwanda. So there's, so there's different sort of ways in which um, old ice motorcycles and e-waste stay in the market, but also get recycled currently. Um, I think some of the gaps that we found is that there's still limited understanding of the date of data. So um, around different types of waste streams and differentiating these two, as well as volumes generated uh, of the different waste streams. Um, limited infrastructure for management of waste, um, and this includes uh, sorting, quantifying, and monitoring. Um, I am aware of, a, of the Mbubo landfill project that is looking to develop a, a facility that includes these different, um, man the different management of waste. So that, um, so, so yeah, so it'll be more it's sort of data on this. Um, there's also a gap around that, just the understanding of the informal sector and the, the informal role of the value chain related to motorcycle waste. So really what happens to the resale and the parts and who the players are in that um, area. Um, con potential current e-waste facilities not being able to manage these large volumes, as well as the small market and possibly limited skills for recycling and reuse. Um, and so these are sort of some some of the gaps that that our program could touch on um, to to support sort of this the sector um, opportunities. Um, so there is a huge opportunity to stimulate to stimulate market transformation for recycling. Um, 
And so there's huge opportunities to really um, catalyze this and, and, and tap into local recycling and provide possibly uh, incentives around this, especially around the e-mobility transition. Um, batteries can be reused and repurposed. Um, some are already doing this, um, and I think this can really be scaled up. Again, extending lifespan of batteries. Um, Again, this is uh, also uh, happening in, in to some extent. Um, and I think the big element here is the, some manufacturers retain ownership of the batteries. Um, and this could possibly lead to better maintenance, battery durability, and easier end of life because it's just one point of, of contact for the batteries. Um, another opportunity is around incentivizing and cycling. So, so including things around take back schemes, um, how the uh, extended producer responsibility um, uh, policy uh, or framework can really support uh, some of this work um, and directives around uh, end of life management of EVs um, as well as retrofitting. Um, and as I've mentioned, our proposal has an, uh, the rebate element, which which to some extent is um, contributes to a, to a take back scheme. And then really creating a culture around recycling um, uh, from the customer, as was mentioned, as well as the um, uh, citizens um, to be part of this process. Um, and so some of the recommendations that we're doing is, is to include an independent waste study to really delve deeper into some of the gaps that we've seen and um, just really how the ecosystem works in terms of finance, resale, and, and what kind of incentives could be provided. Um, uh, government policies and reviews and seeing where, um, where yeah, changes or additions could be made, um, incentives to return bikes to manufacturers and or other organizations, so really tapping into the ecosystem to see um, how everyone could work together on this, um, key performance indicators for monitoring of the impact of this transition from ice to electric motorcycle and, and what happens after life, so really collecting that data around waste management and processing. Um, and then there's a, a, an array of different um, ongoing waste-related initiatives happening in the country. And so really tapping into those, leveraging all the information that's coming from it and, and um, uh, yeah, working together on that. Uh, I think what was mentioned previously is around capacity building as well as awareness raising campaigns. So this is definitely something our proposal will touch on. Um, and then funding and financing to, to, stim to stimulate the market more and, and um, yeah. So, so those are just some of the recommendations that we are thinking through uh, for this project. Um, that's all from my side. Great, thanks a lot. This was super interesting. Um, especially, I really like that you mentioned also the importance of looking at the ice motorcycle waste. You know, because often we think, okay, now with EVs, you know, the, the waste is the biggest issue, but of course that's an issue for, for all type of vehicles and for everything basically so that's the importance of having a circular economy approach where we try to reduce in general you not know, the number of vehicles and and, and things we use in, in our lives because then uh, we have no waste to deal with um, so I think this is super interesting also to see the review and the importance of the e-waste policy for Rwanda and how it fits into the the greater picture and I think we're all very excited to, to see this NAMA moving forward and we wish you all the best in the detailed preparation phase which is probably very intense and yeah, we hope to to see some more um, electric motorcycles uh, on on run and roads soon. So thanks a lot for this, and uh, yeah, so we have some time for questions. Um, if you want to ask them, you can always put them in the chat. And I see there's one already here from Yusuf Sani. Um, for a facility that works with batteries, what standards and or equipment would you recommend that they could use to set one up? Um, I don't know if Jan, you can answer this or if I should put this to Vanessa. Um, I think maybe put it to Vanessa. I think, yeah, it's something that we need to think about. Yeah. No, I think, no, Vanessa, you said you already have a, a e-waste uh, facility. Um, I don't know if there's um, something that um, you, you can give a recommendation on. Vanessa, are you still with us? Uh, she's having a problem with her audio. Okay, no problem, Vanessa. Then maybe um, you can um, either 
put your uh, answer in the chat or um, yeah, we'll get it from you later and then uh, pass it on to the participants. Do we have any other questions? If we don't have them right now, um, there's also gonna be another slot uh, very soon for questions. So um, then I think we can uh, move over to, not too far to Kenya. Uh, and there we have now a presentation from uh, Reina Knoll from uh, GIZ, who's gonna present the work that they have done in Kenya uh, regarding uh, how to handle the uh, end of life issue of EV batteries. Um, so thanks a lot for being with us. And yeah, I see you already sharing your screen. Uh, we can see it, we can see you. Uh, so okay. great. great. Thank you, Annika. Um, little farther this time because my name is Verena Knell. I'm a policy advisor at JZ. I'm based in Bonn, so not in Kenya. So at least in that case, it's a little farther. Um, so in Germany, and I'm working on transport and climate change, particularly in the context of African countries. And today I'll present some insights and policy recommendations for dealing with end of life EV batteries from our work that we did in Kenya. And first, uh, I would like to give you a little bit more context. Um, so from 2016 until last year, 2021, the Advancing Transport Climate Strategies project was active in Kenya, and it worked together with Kenya State Department of Transport to increase the climate ambitions for the transport sector. So this included a lot of diverse activities. One of them was a mitigation option study for Kenya that then highlighted the potential of electric mobility for reducing transport emissions in the road sector. Um, but of course, if you want to push forward with electric mobility, that also brings some challenges with, with it. And one of them was the end of life problem that you have to deal with if you're having a, well, electric, battery, electric vehicles and the batteries in a country. And that is why we um, did a study or this publication that I'm going to focus on in this presentation today um, on dealing with the end of life problems um, of EV batteries in Kenya. And this publication is mainly based on a literature review and also provides then some initial insights and recommendations. So this is just to give you like a little bit of an expectation management. Um, it's going to focus on reuse and recycling. So two things that we also talked about already yesterday in, in this training. And it's mainly focused on lithium ion batteries because these are very relevant for the EV context. So let's start with the reuse, the first part of the waste management. So as we also heard yesterday, I, many of you are probably aware, those batteries, if they are not usable for electric vehicles anymore, still contain like 70 to 80% of the initial energy. So there are a lot of potential um, applications in the market. And for Kenya, this is mainly related to energy storage, or all of them are related to energy storage because that's what a battery does. But for instance, in Kenya, this could be quite interesting for the case of power cuts. Well very up-to-date topic, but also in remote areas where they are not currently connected to the grid. And it's both interesting for private and commercial use. So there's quite a big market for that. And then I also put EV charging infrastructure here as a second potential application, because of course, this is also energy storage in the end, but it is one of the other challenges that is very relevant if you want to push forward with electric mobility is how to set up the infrastructure there. And there are actually some estimations by the World Bank that suggest that if you use second life batteries, you could cut the costs by 90%. So that, of course, also makes this um, very attractive. But then if you're talking about second life applications, um, it's often a question of the time frame because then there are also storage opportunities with new battery technologies and they are becoming, well, they are progressing quite fast. And of course, second life batteries will always remain behind because they are older. But um, there are some good news as well. So in for the US market, there's some estimations that this business might still remain or will remain profitable at profitable at least until 2040. And for Kenya, due to the lower labor costs in the country, it's uh, likely that this will be profitable even longer. So it's really advisable to also build some policies um, based on that. Of course, there are currently some barriers as well. And one is, of course, the availability of EV batteries. So since that is currently only starting, 
Um, not so many batteries are available yet, but it is of course expected that this will um, increase in the future, especially if we consider that Kenya is currently, um, like the Kenyan fleet is currently 80% used vehicles. So if we would assume that that would be the same for electric mobility, then the end of life problem will become quite significant. And at the same time, there are also a lot of local manufacturers already operating in Kenya. So as we are moving towards electric mobility, of course, um, EV batteries that are reaching their end of life are going to be there. Then human capacity is another barrier that is often uh, mentioned. So this includes the battery assessment, the reassembly, and just the knowledge and the skills that you need to do that. Um, and then what is also very important for the policy side, of course, lack of standardization, labeling of the battery. So what is even in the battery um, and legal requirements that could facilitate the reuse are also not, um, not in place yet for, for these batteries. But there is of course some existing experience in Kenya and I just put a few companies here um, on the slide. And I know that there are some of them are also um, in this call or were there um, yesterday. And I'm looking forward to also exchanging with you later in the breakout session. But um, this is just to give an overview that there are already some local companies like Mkopa or Bbox who already have some experience in at least like pilot pro projects on working on second life applicability of those batteries. There's also the We Center, which is well also experienced in performing testings and repackaging of batteries, but they're mainly focused on solar batteries, as, at least as far as I know. And then one really interesting um, option to maybe also explore further in the future is um, doing some cooperations with bigger international companies, like for instance, Acceleron, who's a battery producer, already had a project in Kenya that also focused on second life battery usage. And there are even some information already um, available regarding the cost and how this is competitive with uh, lead acid batteries. So currently here, the estimation was that after 12 years of lifespan, this is going to pay off. But of course, in the future with like better technologies that this might even be, um, well, more more competitive so to say of course um second life applications will only well prolong the the final end of life of a battery so long so of course it's also necessary to think about recycling which is the next step in the waste management hierarchy um and here the main question is often to, if this is a profitable business already it's also a question for well how to design your policies like is this even something that's going to be relevant in the future and here first of all um, it's interesting to highlight that there are already countries where recycling is a profitable business like china and south korea this is not surprising because just in those countries the availability of the batteries is higher and also the technology has been like well developed there and it's more advanced but I think it's also always interesting to kind of turn the question around and don't necessarily only ask if recycling is profitable now, but also to think about the alternative of like not setting up a recycling system. And here um, there are some interesting numbers from a case in Nigeria that we found when doing this publication, um, which looked at the costs of shipping the unprocessed batteries, um, which are really high because this is considered hazardous waste and you have to um, well ap apply or you have to stick to the rules of shipping this waste and then if you would already um, conduct the first steps of the recycling in a country and you get until the step of the black mass and um, that would significantly reduce the costs as you can see here so you can save in this example 32,000 US dollar just for these 50 tons of batteries. So even if recycling is not like yet something that is profitable, it's still um, worth to think about it because otherwise you'll have a massive problem of just what to do with those batteries if you ship them to other countries. Of course, here there are also some barriers currently related to that, that and some of them are very similar to the ones for the second life applicability. Um, which is the availability of the batteries, the human capacities, and also the legal context. So especially the labeling of the batteries is very relevant to know what material has been used because that will also determine the profitability of the recycling. Um, but for the case of recycling, another barrier is also the lack of the e-waste management infrastructure in the country, especially for, um, for um, 
for lithium ion batteries, sorry. <laughs> um, of course, um, there's also some expertise already there to be used, but it's not the same as for um, the second life applicability. So um, for instance, Kenya already has a draft national e-waste management strategy that names some initiatives like the WeCenter Center that are licensed to carry out e-waste recycling. It's also mentioning batteries, but not specifying lithium ion batteries. And those of course have very well, specific um, requirements that come with them. There are also some companies that already have um, well, looked into this topic or have some expertise when it comes to solar waste recycling or in general e-waste management. Um, and for instance, um, we too, or we too, I think there's also someone in this call today, um, already had some plans to also expand their recycling activities to the WeMobility products. So, there's a lot of expertise to, to build on, but it's not yet at a stage where it's like market ready yet in the case of Kenya. Um, but of course, um, this would be a good thing. And there's something that we can also do about that. Um, and this brings me to my last slide, the conclusions and also recommendations that we came up with for this paper. And these are not necessarily exclusive to Kenya, but um, also apply to other countries, but well, also for the Kenyan context. So as a country like Kenya is pushing forward with electric mobility, and we see a lot of um, the uptake of electric vehicles in the country, this end of life question will of course become, well, inevitable somehow. So it is advisable to already think of, about setting up a circular economy now, especially because the second life solutions, which are like the first step of this, are already profitable now. So this could create some domestic value and also gain some time for the recycling steps, which can then be set up later. Um, but of course, it should also be, we should also think about the recycling now to have it then available in the future. And then the last thing that I would like to highlight in this part is also that thinking about a circular economy also means to think about that at every step of the battery's life. So already in the design, for instance, to think about how it can be recycled in the use and then in the reuse and the recycling to consider all these things. And there are basically three fields of action that also, um, well, relate quite well to what was recently presented by other um, speakers. This is for, the first one is legislation, so basically policies. And here, um, first of all, having a recycling legislation, um, including standards for reuse and recycling, like is the case in the European Union with um, there are two directives that, um, that regulate that, or also in Australia, for instance, um, can be very helpful. So this includes things like extended producer responsibility and standards for recycling rates and so on. Um, but of course, also the labeling and standardization of the batteries is quite important. And um, you could also think about regulating the imports. So for instance, Egypt said that only um, EVs that have uh, three years of life maximum can enter the country. And then there are of course also tax incentives that um, you could do to support the businesses. The second one is networking and stakeholder cooperation. So here, as I mentioned already, you can collaborate, for instance, with car manufacturers and battery producers who are also interested in using the, um, the materials from the recycling, for instance. But it could also be a thing to collaborate regionally and think about setting up um, recycling facilities that are used by multiple countries so that you don't have these high costs of shipping them to other countries. And then, of course, to use already existing initiatives like the WE Center. And this brings me to my last point, capacity development. Of course, you can also build upon the, these, the work of those initiatives now um, and the existing expertise that exists. Um, but you should also think about investing in research and development. Like for instance, China has such a plan, um, a research recycling plan. And you can also set up pioneer plants already that can then be expanded in the future. So yeah, that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Looking forward to questions. Um, and if you are interested in the publication, you can also download it here or I will post it in the chat as well. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks, Ordovina. Yeah, please post the link in the chat for people who can't scan the code uh, this quickly, like myself. Um, yeah, so thanks. I'm very happy you spoke about uh, extended producer responsibility because we have an expert now to talk about this, uh, which was uh, Dr. Macharia from Kenya, from the Ministry of Environment, who has pre prepared the presentation of 10 minutes. 
uh, to uh, explain a bit what, what is being done on the policy level in Kenya. Um, and we don't need to go to too much details, whatever we can't cover uh, right now in these 10 minutes, we can take them along for the breakout session since we have two rooms, one for Rwanda and one for Kenya, but we can also address some of the questions that we can't answer right now. Uh, but I, I still invite uh, the speakers, for example, uh, Jihan, to look at the question, for example, from uh, David Dumberger um, about uh, how you see a customer uh, buy battery buyback team uh, working operationally, uh, and also the question to Verena on the uh, black mass uh, cost issues. So yeah, please uh, prepare your answers if you can, uh, and then we can either take them after Dr. Masharia's presentation or in the breakout sessions. And with that, uh, I hope uh, you are here with us, Dr. Masharia. I can share the presentation for you if you like. Please, please go ahead and share. Yeah, okay. Now good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. I will share it now. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Now, my presentation is about our journey, where we have come from and where we are, and the next steps, and what is inside our documentation for extended producer responsibility. Uh, next slide. Uh, currently, our waste management is linear, where the producer places items in the market, the consumer buys and uses, and then uh, everything is discarded into the dump site. Next slide. So we have a lot of garbage open dumping. Next slide. Uh, so. We, we are just about to get into EPR. Uh, already we, we are celebrating two companies are already working in Kenya. But our EPR emanated from the ban, the popular ban in Kenya for polythene carrier bags in 2017. After we banned the, 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 the carrier bags, then the PT bottles became very visible and the private sector approached us to uh, help them to handle the PT plastics. And in the process of implementing the PT plastic collection, it was realized that there were very many joyriders who are not ready to take up the responsibility of managing the, the PT bottles. And so in 2019, the private sector, uh, that is KEPSA and uh, Kenya Association of Manufacturers, uh, requested the ministry to ensure that there is level playing ground uh, through EPR regulations. And that is where we, we started. So uh, 2019, we developed the regulation. By January 2020, we had our draft. Then we did uh, public consultation, and uh, including with the private sector. And now we have our regulations ready. It is with the Attorney General. And uh, we are hoping that it will be ready if not this month, by next month, we should have the legislation signed. Next slide. So I think I have explained that. Uh, now, what is in our uh, EPR legislation? We didn't have a supporting act of parliament. And in July this year, we we got uh, our legislation signed by the president, that is the Sustainable Waste Management Act, and section 13 requires that every producer should bear EPR responsibility obligations, uh, which they can fulfill individually or collectively. And the cabinet secretary was asked within two years to uh, enact the EPR regulations. Fortunately, we, were, we, we had already done that uh, so we are on course in implementing section 13 of the of the act. Next slide. Next slide. Now, uh, the Kenyan law. No, back, 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 back. One slide there. Uh, the Kenyan law puts 30 items under EPR, and these are in five categories. The first two categories are packaging, packaging materials. 
So we have divided packaging into two categories. That is packaging for non-hazardous and packaging for hazardous products. So for non-hazardous, these are plastics, papers, aluminum, composite, glass, and cotton. And then for hazardous, the last slide, for hazardous, we have the industrial chemicals, oil and lubricants, pharmaceuticals, uh, anything hazardous is there. But I'm keen on the number three and perhaps four, where e-waste is a category by itself, which includes equipment, mercury auto switches, thermostats, battery and accumulators. And then we have number four, the end of motor vehicle, the end of life motor vehicles, automobiles, aircrafts, and locomotives. So you can see uh, already uh, we have very many items at our EPR, uh, which includes our, our area of interest this afternoon. Next slide. Uh, so, so what we are waiting for is uh, the little gazettement of the regulation, which I say is, if not this month, by next month, uh, it would be there. Then we will do producer mobilization and sensitization. We will register the producers uh, who will be registered by the National Environment Management Authority. Then the producers will establish producer responsibility organizations. And uh, we are now uh, doing the guidelines with the Danish governments. We already have a consultant on board. And then we have, uh, we will also engage in development of product specific guidelines. And then the producers by themselves will declare their volumes so that we get uh, baselines. And then uh, EPR operation logistics, they will develop that and then engage in reporting. Next slide, please. So the role of the ministry is to uh, gazette the national objectives, frameworks, and targets for EPR compliance schemes, and also issue guidelines to support implementation of the regulations, uh, publicize the national targets and guidelines, and uh, facilitate consultations leading to the formation of the five PROs that I projected earlier. Next slide. Next slide. Now, uh, how the how the EPR will run the EPR will run is that all producers will be required to register themselves with the NEMA, and once they register, they will obtain a number, and they will use that number to to register to 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 establish the the producer responsibility organization. So they will look for each other peer to peer, and then they establish the five companies. Uh, that I have explained earlier. Next slide. So, so, uh, so I've said you obtain a number and then uh, the companies, the five companies will be required to acquire annual operating license from NEMA. So, so the companies will be registered first by the, the registrar of companies and then they will be recognized as a PRO by NEMA and they will receive annual operating licenses from, from NEMA. Next slide. Now, uh, so the, we have already given them uh, uh, what uh, the, the, the requirements for registration. Uh, we expect that uh, once the company uh, that requires to be recognized as a producer responsibility organization submits the application to, to NEMA. They will be given 90 days to do further mobilization and to make sure everybody is on board. And then after 90 days, then there will be the, the big company, the, the, the full registration will come after 90 days. Next slide. And the requirements for registration are these ones that are projected now. Uh, we will require uh, minutes of meeting for the sector members, uh, which shall be attended by at least 30 companies. And uh, we expect that during their first meeting, they also uh, appoint uh, interim officials. And then we need a resolution in the minutes that they, they have a business name, which will be reserved by the registrar of companies. 
and then they also present the list of the members. Uh, then, after 90 days, they come back with the proof of registration of the company. The company will be limit, a, comp a limited company, but limited by guarantee. And then they will now bring more members, the updated list of membership, including the fee structure of the membership. Then they will provide an EPR plan, uh, signed minutes of, of, the, of, the, of the meetings, and then a copy of lease agreement uh, for, for an office, for office space where they are located. And then they will, they will be required to pay some prescribed fee to, the, to them. They must have a, a dispute resolution mechanism because there are many, many companies. And then in their articles of memorandum of association, they should declare that the sole business of the company is to undertake APR obligations. And then the directors who will who, 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 who be answerable to the company, uh, then the, 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 we would like to have change of the directorship every two years. And then uh, they, they, they also show how they, are, they, they, they have structured the APR fees. Uh, next slide, please. So the other thing that they present is an EPL plan. So how do you intend to implement or to, to fulfill your obligations through the PRO? So the EPL plan will be submitted to the authority. Next slide. And the EPR components are number one, volumes, declare your volumes, the baseline for the products. Then what do you want to do with your volumes? We need you to set aside some materials for reuse, recycling, and uh, also how do you intend to do recovery? How will you collect from throughout the Republic? How do you collect your, your packaging or your materials? Logistics, recycling, and the composting system, and end of life disposal for the products. Then how do you moderate, mod, moderate the EPR fees? Uh, how do you calculate what each member is supposed to pay? They have to declare that to the government. And then public awareness and uh, consumer education on the same. The other thing is uh, verifiable uh, paid up membership. How many members? Next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, then they have to procure the service providers. Then they have to engage in eco design. So what are they thinking about eco design? Then some of the materials they may want to, to, to advise the government to ban them. So we will receive such recommendations. Then they are supposed to do annual reporting. Uh, they are supposed to do training and capacity building for the members. And then organize monitoring of the members, product uh, traceability system, inspections, uh, so that uh, any member who is uh, not compliant, uh, they are we are supposed to undertake enforcement action. Then how do you finance the scheme? Uh, so all this information is the one that we would like them to present to the authority in the EPR plan. Next slide. Uh, so, so that is in the EPR plan. And uh, once they are allowed to register their company as a PRO, then they will now undertake the obligations. Uh, the obligations are such as uh, organize and manage collection, sorting, material recovery, recycling, treatment. So they are fully responsible for all their products and packaging. Then establish post-consumer collection and take-back schemes, uh, provide financial contributions to be used to uh, finance their scheme, uh, modulation of EPR fees. It is not the law of the government to set the fees to be paid by each member. They will regulate themselves. We have only provided guidelines. And then public awareness, very important. Next slide. Uh, the other one is market development for secondary raw materials. They, they are supposed to participate in that development. Then research and development programs for on emerging technologies to improve material recovery. And then should they feel that there is anything that needs to be restricted and banned, then they will propose to the, to the government. And then also, what are their targets? They are supposed to come up with those targets so that together with the government, when the government is convinced, then 
the, the ministry will, uh, will publicize that as, as the targets for the, for the country. Then also uh, monitoring for the membership activities to, to, to make sure that everybody is active and also trigger inspections by, by the government. Next slide, please. Uh, now, the other thing is uh, we have two layers of government in Kenya. We have governments at national level and at the county, and uh, the counties will be involved in uh, the producer responsibility organization. And uh, so the, the PLO are supposed to work with the devolved governments, the, 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 the municipalities of, of sort. We call them counties here. So that the, there is collection done there transportation and sorting and disposal. This is because the other law, the Sustainable Waste Management Act National, says that waste should be disposed within the boundaries of the county. So they need to make sure that should there not be a composting for a recycling facility in the county, then they work with the counties to make sure that waste moves from one county to another. Uh, and they, also the issue of infrastructure, they need to, to know where their infrastructure is and uh, establish appropriate mechanisms for uh, operationalization of the EPR schemes. So, so working with the, with the local governments, uh, the counties is therefore very important. Next slide. So in summary, uh, we see that uh, implementation of the EPR regulations is quite, quite evolving, uh, where different players play complementary roles uh, mapping of roadmap is critical for smooth EPR implementation, and we have already we have already mapped what needs to be done, including registration, the EPR plan, and implementation. Uh, we why we did the EPR regulation is to ensure that participation of all players is uh, is done, and which is very critical for its success. Then the issue of public and producer level awareness is so important. And of course, simplified guidelines are needed and we have embarked on development of the same. Next slide. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is very, very interesting. And I can definitely agree with the first summary you made that it seems that setting up an EPR is a very uh, labor intensive and complex, I think, uh, you, you have done a great job in, in showing us uh, how, how it can be done. And uh, I wish you all the best for success. Um, and with that, um, I would like to now uh, uh, give us into uh, breakout rooms. So now uh, we will then have time to discuss some of what we've heard before, but also to, to develop new recommendations. And the breakout rooms, since we've heard uh, from Kenya uh, and Rwanda uh, in this um, webinar, uh, we'll have uh, one breakout room each and all the participants have the chance to select if they either want to talk on the Kenya uh, case or um, for uh, Rwanda. And um, we have 25 minutes for this. So we're going to meet back again here at 3.45 uh, East African time. And then we'll have um, a kind of a, a feedback from the breakout rooms uh, and uh, summary. And then we'll send you all uh, for a coffee break. So I'm gonna, I hope this works now. So I'll click on the breakout rooms. Uh, let participants choose a room. Sorry. Okay, I think, um, can someone give me feedback if you can <laughs> have an option now to, to choose? Hi, Annika. Um, I can choose. I've got the option. Perfect. Um, I'm just unsure about which room is for which place. It says room one and room two. Oh, yeah. Sorry. That was um, so room one is Rwanda and room two is Kenya in the order of it was presented. So yeah, please, room one for Rwanda and room two for Kenya.
Again, room one for Rwanda, room two for Kenya. Oh, I forgot to mention that in room one, we have French translation in case anybody uh, would prefer to have the discussion in French. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, Verena, thank you for sharing the screen. Yeah, so I just shared it. I wasn't sure like how we're going forward. I think there's a moderator assigned, but I just had the link and I thought maybe people already want to add something. So. Yeah. Um, can you share the link in the chat so we can please? Yeah. Uh, I did, but I can only share it in the overall chat. I don't know. I, I'm using the browser version. so. Okay. Let's see if I can. Um, do, does everybody here have access to it? Let's see. Um, yes, I have. So who doesn't, I just posted in the big chat again for the Kenya. Um, so yeah, so everybody can uh, hopefully access the Denbert and then uh, put the, because we heard a lot about the importance of different stakeholders for end of life management of batteries. So um, I would suggest that we um, kind of use the, uh, the, the post-its to put on uh, different names of actors that we think uh, most important for um, the different uh, aspects: circular design, repairing, repurposing, and recycling. Um, and then there's a there's for others outside of the, the three. 
heckles. You can always uh, make the post-its bigger and then put the words in there. A double click and then write something in there. And also I would like uh, uh, to ask if, if one of uh, the participants would later um, be able to um, give a quick uh, summary of what uh, we're uh, working on right now. And I hope you saw that there's um, three different slides. So when you click on the top right, uh, you can move to the uh, achievements. So there we can name some of the initiatives and then challenges and, and gaps. And if you have anything that uh, you would like to mention doesn't fit exactly into uh, one of these uh, boxes, then you can just uh, put it on a poster and put it uh, aside. And also, um, we are a smaller group now, so if anybody has any questions or ideas or suggestions or cannot use them, you can also just um, unmute yourself and uh, speak to the group. Thanks a lot. I think the circles were just moved. I hope everything is back in the right place now. Maybe if you added a card, you can also check. So you can all see now what I'm adding, but I don't know what you're adding. So <laughs> I feel like people should really speak up because otherwise this is like really me like on the in the spotlight. But I'm just adding that I heard from my colleague Herman, who can unfortunately he had to leave because he has another appointment, that there's also a new GIZ project coming up, like following the tracks activities that I just um, announced. Um on it's going to be focused on e-mobility, and there are also some pilots plans for EV battery waste. So I'm going to put it there, but don't ask me about it. It's Herman who's <laughs> involved in that. Yeah, great. Thanks, Rina. Yeah, no, I've also I've been looking at, and for example, in terms of regulations, now we heard that um, there is this you know, EPR uh, regulation that's that's being worked on. So I think that's also something that is there in, in like achievements on the second slide. Um, mm -hmm. And then you can also just put, um, like I think we had a very few companies mentioned, I think, no, uh, the WeCenter, Wet2, 
are cried. So also if what what um if you have any like initiatives or um or something that has worked well already, um, or what types of economical and environmental gains you see from the work you've done. Uh, that's also something we can put in here. And of course, and the last side, the, the challenges. Um, for example, if um, there's no um, equipment available for um, recycling, or there is any a tax regime that prevents you from you know, um, repurposing um, uh, batteries, that's also issues that uh, we can mention here. And of course, also, I'm very interested about the the business model side, because I think remember Rena mentioned something about that it's very profitable to do that, you know, because um, of the high value of lithium ion batteries. But I think to set up the ecosystem, that's probably um, uh, still very um, uh, uh, initial stages, probably not profitable. So um, I think that would be um, interesting. Yeah, I just checked. I think Lavenda, you're you said you're from Way Too, right? Like I was also interested because I had only done this publication based on some literature research. Um, but I was also interested in well, what are your updates? Because I only read that you you're having some plans, but um, I don't know if you're still well in the call. You can hear us. I think that would be great if you could add your insights. Because that was really one of the very interesting cases that we came across. Okay, I'm not sure if, if the technical that people can't talk, just ask Verena, I don't know. Can someone just say hi to confirm that the unmute button works, please? Hi. Ah, perfect. Yeah. Great, okay, so there's no excuse. <laughs> hi. Hello. Hi. Yeah, that's good. I thought uh, <laughs> the experts are not Verena and uh, myself, but rather uh, the, the rest of... Oh you all in the call, so. Um. Yeah, let us know if there's something you want to add. I can also, I'm, I know how to add cards now, so I can add cards for somebody else if you, I don't know, sometimes people are joining from their mobile phones, especially if there's this power cut now in Kenya, so yeah. just let me know. I'm happy to also put some stuff there, oh, but there are also cards appearing, so I guess we're fine. Yeah, exactly. If someone can't use this Jamboard, because yeah, also sometimes join on my phone while I'm, while I'm at the gym and <laughs> the call, and then of course it's difficult. So uh, feel free to also either speak up or um, put the uh, the words in the chat, and we can help you with the cards. Um, so. Hi, this is Nyaga uh, with uh, Sustainable Transport Africa. Sorry, yeah. I'm on the move, so difficult to interact. So um, at the moment, I'm just listening. I'm sorry about. That. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Again, I've been there um, as well. Um, hi, I'm Felix from ArcRide. Um, essentially, the reason I put our solution or our plan in repairing and repurposing is because we came from our sister company, which is Solar Mini Grid Company, and they were using um, essentially the same lithium ion batteries as where our, our business um, sort of was, uh, was born. Um, so we, it's probably the, the side that we put the least sort of uh, thought into. Um, at the minute, we think we're going to repurpose the, the individual cells within the batteries to for sort of solar home system uses or for mini grid uses, basically for yeah second life batteries in, in those spaces. But it's um, really something which I'd like to learn more about. You know what what 
other solutions are on the market um, and what we might do in the future. So yeah, I just wanted to learn from other people too. Great. Yeah, no, thanks, Felix. And I think that's probably for, for most of us, right? In the beginning, when you buy or invent a new product, you don't think about the end of life of the product, right? Because the idea is, of course, to, to have uh, no, a good high quality product that's going to last as long as possible, but eventually, of course, it's going to go to end. I think that's something that we also see now you know, in, in other markets where um, no, because of course, if we have a lithium ion battery that has a life of eight years, we still have lots of time for them to to get to the end of life or end of their first life, right? Not their second life. So, um, of course, but then it's always good to to plan ahead and like some, especially on uh, on this side of the world where we will receive also many no used uh, EVs from, let's say, Europe or or here in Japan, um, in Kenya. So I think that's also something that we need to not only think about the the e-waste that we or companies or whatever will create in in Kenya, but also of course the e-waste that uh, will come from outside and how we can you not know, use them to the maximum extent, as 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 we had said in the calls that you no, know, they will still be at 70, 80 percent after the uh, use in the vehicle, and then how then you no, know, then what, what Felix also said, but they came from like how they can be used for for mini grids, you no, know, or for um, uh, lighting of devices in rural areas, also of course. So I think. That's also something where um, we have to be clear it's end of first life, end of second life. So kind of have this this in place and then see kind of how, uh, no, I think that's also what Dr. Masharia mentioned, the call, the importance of uh, private and public actors working together there, you know, like the, the public side, of course, putting in place the regulatory framework based on feedback received from, from companies. Um, and so that, um, yeah, they also know what, what to uh, regulate and what to put policies in place. Yeah, please, uh, Dr. Yeah, thanks for, you can, yeah, welcome to speak. Thank you, I, I, I wanted to comment about uh, uh, the electronics, the challenge in Africa, where we do a lot of importation of used, used electronics. And although countries have laws that, uh, uh, that prohibit, importation of e-waste, like Kenya. Kenya has, has such a law. It is illegal to import e-waste in Kenya, but we have a challenge of used electronics where some of the electronics reach our port when it is not working. It is not, uh, the electronic is not working. It's not in working condition. And the same case goes for even vehicles. Uh, some of the vehicles that come to the country, especially the, elect the, elect the electric ones, may have that challenge of the battery is almost at the end of life, towards the end of life. And uh, this may contribute to increase in uh, e-waste in our country and uh, with the limited uh, capacity, it is a challenge. However, uh, as a country, we are looking forward to the, to the enactment of the EPR regulation because uh, it will address that problem where the private sector, the producers have to uh, come up with mechanisms of handling uh, that used electronic that will be part of the EPR scheme. Uh, and also, we, we will need to tighten our laws to make sure that uh, used electronics, there is confirmation before shipping to ensure that the electronic is working before it is shipped to Kenya. So that, those are some of the some of the areas we are exploring. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks a lot. I think this, this is a very valuable uh, comment. No? And also it shows the one that importance, but also the complexity of the problem. Now, as we saw, like all these different laws and regulations have to be in place to, to prevent that from happening. And then, of course, also we need um, uh, people to enforce these regulations you know, and make sure that there's a, a quality check also before um, these things actually get to, to export, right? Which you often see that the only do the controls at the port of import, you know, for example, with used vehicles, often that that is not enough, but rather there needs to be also some regulations from the other side that, that exports this. Um, batteries that are maybe not um, to, to the full capacity anymore. So I think that's also a very important point.
Yeah, hi, Anthony, please. Good to hear from Nigeria, right? Yes, I am in Nigeria, Nigeria but uh, uh, this the unique thing about Africa is that we share the common challenges and uh, what, what is uh, applicable in Rwanda uh, would also be applicable here too. The part I want to, uh, just to add to what the last speaker said, about uh, regulations. I also think there is need for uh, an intercontinental uh, kind of uh, um, treaty that can support e-waste transportation and, and importation and exportation within countries. Because if uh, there is an e-waste saying in uh, Japan and the government in Japan should also work towards uh, reducing the amount of uh, e-waste that is being exported outside their countries. Even it will also help countries in Africa uh, when, when they work together, countries uh, between the two countries or African Union, EU, or the one in uh, the Asian continent, they are, they are the umbrella body for the countries there. So it will help the countries also uh, curtail the amount of e-waste that has been brought into Africa at that level. When it is being agreed up there, this port, before things move out of the port, there are, there are procedures that, is, that is supposed to be carried out to check, uh, is this the acceptable e, uh, uh, electronics that is coming in as it as the uh, the life of the pro the product been as it reaches its uh, its waste life, so instead of sending exporting it out, it could be curtailed at, at the country level there. So that's my contribution. Thank you. Thanks a lot for this, Anthony. Very valuable comment, and I think yeah, what you just said, it's very important to have this uh, also Pan African approach, right? Because you said the challenges are very similar between East and West Africa. So I think it's very important that we also now have this uh, peer to peer exchange between regions and come into agreement with these bodies that we have in the African Union, as you mentioned. Um, I think this is very interesting. Yeah, Vincent, please. Um, thank you. Uh, um, so my name is Vincent. Um, I work uh, with Ampersand e-mobility in Kenya. So if, if you look at uh, the landscape of uh, EV transition in Kenya, both in uh, motorcycle and uh, the buses, it is happening so fast because the ecosystem is allowing. But uh, one thing I would like to point out is the aspect of uh, interoperability. Um, you realize the swap model for batteries especially the electric motorcycles. Every company is coming up with its own uh, soft stations. And what we are likely to experience in the future is uh, a very big kind of a technical confusion where we'll have uh, batteries being decommissioned uh, coming from uh, different soft stations from different companies. And there might not be a very clear part of uh, dealing with uh, such kind of cost, even that you have to understand why fast the battery fail. And um, so I think the charging protocols uh, would help, but uh, the interoperability in terms of uh, charging protocols, uh, you realize currently every company is using its own charging protocol. And it's not open uh, to every other company. So if we could have a universal or an open uh, charging protocol, then that would help. Uh, address such issues that would come uh, later in terms of operations and healing the waste that would come from the motorcycles and the vehicles. Yeah, indeed, that's that's a big point. Um, of course, now if we um, uh, if you look into um, recycling, that's important that we have you not know, the batteries also. Uh, similar right because that makes it easier otherwise there needs to be different systems for each battery type um unfortunately we have to go back to the the main room now um is there someone of you who i mean you don't have to cover everything on the slides but just to give like a brief overview of, of what we discussed or what you think are the main um 
challenges uh, in, in this topic to the main room. No? Okay, then uh, I will try. No, I know it's, it's, it's difficult um, with these types of uh, online uh, interactive sessions when, <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, so then uh, thank you all. I will go back to the, the main room now. Thank you, Annika. Okay, um, thanks everyone. I hope most of you are back now in the main room. I know it's never enough time and it takes a while also to familiarize um, oneself with the uh, technology. Um, and yeah, also of course, if you're on the go, it's a bit hard to, to write post-its. <laughs> um, I see people are slowly coming back. Thanks, Francois. I see you are sharing for Rwanda. Yes, I think we are both one, right? Yes, please. That would be great. You are room one, so you get the chance to start. So thanks a lot. So, as we as we wait, as we waiting for other people. You are muted now, Francois. Yes, I'm saying uh, as we are waiting for the possibility to return, I'll be sharing. And if everybody is ready, then we can do it. Yeah, I think uh, we can start. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. We were in the group one, which was. Uh, uh, dedicated to Rwanda, and the, we, we, our first exercise was to map the stakeholders. We had to have uh, people from the public institutions, people from the international organizations, and NGO, as well as the, the university academia. So, some people do one of the design, repair, recycling, as you see. The other one do both, recycling and repairing. The other one do the design and the repairing. And the, the other one can do three, which was really a good sample. The other where it's more of starting people. So then uh, we we have been discussing with people who has achievements, uh, initiatives, economic gain, and and the and the policies and the environmental gains. Initiatives. We have seen the training initiatives, initiative neutral fitting. We have seen initiatives and in women empowering, that means the women inclusion in e-mobility and so forth. Then environmental gains, as far as the battery is concerned, recycling, and there is a reduction in environmental hazard or environmental pollution. And then we have uh, the opposite of greenhouse emissions from a missing in the battery products. And then when we go to economic again, that means women empowering that also contributes to economic development. And then you have a potential revenue from multi companies. And finally, for the policies, we have immobility standard, we have immobility policies as shared by the Ministry of Infrastructure. And then finally, we analyze the gaps 
our challenges and the way forward for policy as policy as concerned uh, we we are lacking some uh, uh, standards or for e mobility equipment and we still have uh, issues or gaps in policy on the uh, battery recycling and so forth and as far as the regression we have a regression but which lacks more on the ite waste so that means we need to revise and include the uh, provision of e-mobility i mean e but the e-batteries as people will be revising the regression is on e-waste and then we have in the enforcement also that as part of the way forward uh, whatever we have with device but we need also an enforcement as far as the e batteries is concerned and then if i try to be very quick uh, for the finance as as for example you have a road maintenance fund and so other funds we don't have a fund for immobility e immobility e that means also the e batteries so that means the combination was to uh, to provide the establish a fund for that and they provide the more investment capacity building we still have uh, the capacity gap the mini curriculum for e batteries so establishing a training center with uh, those skills can be helpful yeah let me so by here thank you very much that was what we discussed briefly for other more information you can visit the down board thank you yeah, thanks a lot, Francois. Uh, great work and thanks for presenting. Uh, Francois is from the city of Kigali, for those of you who don't know him. Um, he's working on the mobility there. And yeah, maybe if someone can uh, post the, the, the link to the Randa Jamboard in the chat so that all colleagues can, can have a look at that as well, that would be great. Thanks a lot. Um, and then I'll briefly um, show um, what um, uh, the Kenya team has done. And um, I'm gonna uh, put the, the power cuts um uh to the reason why <laughs> we maybe uh, don't have as as much on the jamboard as as the team from rwanda um yeah uh because of course when you're on your phone it's a bit difficult to to write post it so uh bear with us in, in that sense um but uh as you can see um here uh we have um a few uh stakeholder maps so like mostly on the repair and repurposing side you can see it's mostly um private companies who um who are working on the topic um, and then uh, and that's mostly local companies which I found very interesting and then on the circular design side we have also like international uh, OEMs um, and then on the recycling part I think it was um, quite clear also from the presentations that the public sector plays a big role because it's um, sort of a also part of a public service of course and, and together with the private sector to to put in place the, the facilities for recycling of uh, any type of uh, waste material. I think that's um, that's also uh, important to note. Um, and then uh, in terms of achievements, I think what was also clear from the presentations we got is that there are many initiatives uh, already in Kenya, no? such as uh, Way2, B-Box, and Popa, We Center. Uh, and uh, I think the other uh, big player, of course, as we saw, was the Ministry of Environment. Dr. Masharia showed us how important it is to, to be very thorough in developing these extended producer responsibility regulations. And that is actually not an easy task to do, and that involves many steps and also actors that are responsible. No, it's a, it's a, always need to go hand in hand with uh, the private uh, sector who, who are responsible for the product. So I think that's also very important. That it's not only uh, one actor that's important, but that's a collaboration. And I think also one one big number that that we saw from I think from Reina's presentations is the the big reductions in CO two emissions that we can see if we uh, reuse materials, right? And I think the other uh, big aspect is of course also that I think there was uh, uh, Vanessa from Ministry of Environment highlighted that uh, the impact on uh, the human health, uh, you know, for an improper recycling of e waste is also a very big big topic. Uh, and of course, in terms of uh, economic aids, I would say that. Uh, we haven't put it on the slide yet, but that um, uh, the use of like no raw materials are limited, and then if you reuse them, of course the the input input to the to the battery will be cheaper, and, and eventually uh, we can reduce uh, the cost of electric vehicles by reusing materials, uh, which of course will then make it more accessible to um, the wider population. 
Um, and then in terms of um, challenges, I think one big challenge is, of course, the, the regulations for, from both, I think, import and export side. Um, not because uh, we need to see when, like right now in Kenya and in many African countries, over 80% of vehicles are used vehicles. Uh, so if that's going to be a similar structure with electric uh, vehicles, then, of course, we will get many um, uh, batteries that are already towards uh, the end of their life as a for a vehicle. So that's why it's also important that at the export side from whatever Europe, uh, Japan, that there are regulations in place to ensure that uh, there's no dumping of, of um, batteries that are at the end of the capacity. And then, of course, also on, on the import side to make sure there are regulations. I think Dr. Masharia made very clear that uh, there's no um, uh, e-ways to be imported to Kenya, uh, which I think is very important uh, for, for all these uh, issues. And then the other topic that was mentioned by uh, Vincent from Ampersand was the, the challenge of interoperability and different battery types and standards. And of course, that makes it also uh, difficult to, to go into uh, recycling, uh, because if you need different equipment for different batteries, um, that of course is, is, uh, is a challenge. And then uh, one of the solutions um, or gaps and then possible solution that was mentioned by uh, Anthony from Nigeria, which I found very, very valuable comment as well, that um, uh, that there needs to be sort of a pan-African approach and that we need intercontinental agreements uh, on, on how to deal with this topic. Um, for example, players like the African Union are very important, European Union also to to uh, see because the challenges are, are similar between East and West Africa and South Africa, as, as we could also see yesterday. I think uh, it, the importance here not that not every country has to uh, go their own path, but uh, we can uh, exchange uh, amongst uh, ourselves there. And um, yeah, I think um, that uh, are the main gaps and challenges. Um, and with that, I'll stop sharing um, my screen, uh, or I try to uh, stop share. Okay. Um, then uh, maybe let me invite uh, for all our speakers that are still here to maybe briefly turn on the camera so I can thank them personally. Uh, and also every participant is more than welcome to uh, quickly show their face. We're very happy to, to have you all here. Um, and uh, we thank you all also for your um, active participation in the chat and the, and the, and the rooms. And um, yeah, I think this is a, a great uh, last day of our training program. Um, you can always uh, reach out to us if um, you have any feedback to our training. We will set around also a feedback form um, uh, about the training where you are able to um, yeah, give us feedback, but also let us know what other topics um, uh, are interested, uh, interesting to you. And um, yeah, I think with that, um, I want to especially thank, of course, uh, Emily and, and Judith as well um, for uh, organizing the sessions and uh, to all the speakers. Um, and yeah, with that, it's 4 p.m. Uh, we will definitely share recording and slides to everyone, um, and they will all be on our website. Um, I think um, the Solutions Plus website will, will have all of them. I will post the link and also, I think, send you a follow up email with that. And I don't know, Emily, Judith, um, anything you wanted to add? No? I I think you covered it very well. We will have uh, further uh, training uh, opportunities in person, online, at your own pace, uh, webinars like this. So please stay in touch. Don't hesitate to contact us if you have any needs, any desire for future training. And that's it. Thanks, Anika. Okay, great. Thanks, all. Um, and... oh. I could just add, we'll send an email with the presentation and the recording. Great. Thanks, Judith. Okay. Bye, everyone. It was good to see some faces now. <laughs> bye. Thanks, and bye. Bye-bye.